time Make a difference One cup at a time So be sure to grab your tea Grab a seat And tune in to Miss Liz Tea time Make a difference One cup at a time Well, welcome to Tea Time. Guess who's here? Miss Liz is back. That's right. And it is February 8, 2024. Can you believe that we're already in February? We're almost going into March. Uh, it is just flying by. Another year is just going through the window like no tomorrow, right? So if you haven't subscribed to the Miss Liz's YouTube channel, please go over and subscribe. Ring that little doorbell and you'll be notified when Miss Liz is live. Today is going to be self-care, grief, acceptance, and self-love. And we all have to take the time to take care of ourselves. So today I have two incredible guests that are joining me. This afternoon I have Kelly Dark 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 Herdery joining me. And then I have Paul Marr joining me tonight at 7 p.m. I'm gonna get Kelly to pronounce her last name because I don't want to mess it up. And we have some really incredible good news. So I really want to get Kelly in here. But before we get all that good stuff going, we're gonna do the disclaimer, a little bit of bio on Kelly. And then we're going to get Kelly in here. And we're going to share you a good transformation, empowerment, and awareness tea today. That's the type of tea that we're serving in this house. So disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by Miss Liz is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward, for, forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutic advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookymissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea time shows are done on Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, every Thursday, every week. If it's a Monday or Tuesday, it's a rescheduled tea time or a second tea time guest is coming back for a second cup of tea or third, fourth or fifth, because we do have those guests that like to come back once in a while. So now a little bit on Kelly. Who is Kelly? Well, Kelly is an FT um, courier for, uh, let me see. Why am I reading there? I'm reading, I, I have it right here. Kelly's a, a seasoned expert in grief counseling with over two decades of experience. Her dedication and passion for helping individuals cope with the loss of a loved one shines through in everything she does. As a fellow in thank, thank, thank her theology, I'm going to get her to tell me that word, the study of death, dying, and bereavement. And as a clinical social worker, she brings a unique perspective to the field. But Kelly's journey is in grief counseling is more than professional. It's deeply personal. She was she has faced her own experiences with loss, which had which have only deepened her commitment to, to to guiding others through the challenging journeys of grief. Kelly is a visionary behind the Center for Informed Grief LLC, offering training and resources to therapists and educators to become more grief informed. In addition to her counseling work, Kelly is a published author. She's a con contributor to Hostile Mental Health and Brave Kids. And she is the lead collaborator of the book that we're going to talk about. So we're going to get Kelly in here because I want to talk about this book. So welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. It is a pleasure to have you here. And I didn't want to mention the name of the book because I want you to say the name of the book. And I want you to give the good news on this book. Good. But Absolutely. 
So it's called The Grief Experience, Tools for Acceptance, Resilience, and Connection. And it was released on Amazon on Tuesday of this week, and it's already a bestseller. And when I woke up Wednesday morning, it was um, a bestseller in three different categories, which I was super excited about, especially the category called Grief and Loss, which just, I mean, I just, I was crying when I saw it. I was so excited. I am so proud of what we've created. And it's a collaborative book, which is really exciting. So it wasn't just about me. It was 25 authors that came together and we all wrote it together. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful book. It has a lot of different types of grief. So it really could be for anybody. And I think whoever picks it up is going to be able to relate to at least one of the authors in that book. So Kelly, what got you started with grief? My mom died when I was 14 and following her death, I was a teenager that was really struggling and didn't have really the supports that I needed. So my dad got me to join a hospice grief group and that group changed my life. I can never give enough credit to that social worker, Rini. And for her offering that group, finally felt like I wasn't alone in my grief and was able to connect with other grieving teenagers, which made a huge difference in my life. And after a while of doing groups, Rini asked me to start volunteering with the children's groups. And that's when I knew that this is what I wanted to do with my life. And so I went and got my master's in social work and throughout my career, I've worked at a couple of different hospices. And now I own a private practice where I specialize in grief and loss. But I really, I, I attributed it all to my mom's death. I mean, I find meaning in my grief every day by the work that I do. And I feel like because of her death, I'm able to help so many people. Well, and sometimes, sometimes a loss is also a blessing, right? And it's a hard, hard thing to go through. But I mean, it also gives us the, that those steps and tools to move forward and see how we can help others, right? Um, Absolutely. Kelly, I want to go back to the little girl before your mom died. Who was Kelly? Mm -hmm. A little awkward, a little shy, a little goofy. Um, my mom got sick on um, when I was in seventh grade. And she actually had her mastectomy on Halloween day. And I think it's kind of interesting because my Halloween costume for that year was I was dressed as a corpse. Oh. Yeah, very, in, right? A really scary costume. Um, I was blue skin. I had bugs all over me. I wore a tattered dress. My, I think I had stolen the costume from my sister who was it the year before. And I won the scariest costume award. And I'm dressed as this, never knowing that like in a couple of years, I was going to be facing my mom's death while she was at the hospital having her mastectomy. So it's kind of, when you think about it, it's kind of interesting. Um, what had happened. And my mom, she was a stay at home mom. And I know sometimes we put people on a pedestal when somebody dies, but my mom was pretty awesome. Was she, did she have some faults? Absolutely. But she was really kind and caring. She, everybody knew her in the neighborhood because she walked everywhere. She never got her license. So she was always out in the community, always friendly. We'd stop and have tea with this person. We'd go to this person's house for tea. Like that was a big thing. And I was always kind of her tag along. You know, I was always with her. I was the youngest out of the three of us. And my sisters were both away at college while this was all going on. So I think there is almost a pre-Kelly before my mom got sick. And then even that Kelly when my mom was sick and then post-Kelly. Um, and even then, even another post Kelly, because I've evolved and changed, <laughs> you know, and grown up. And if you would have seen me the year after my mom died, I was, I was a mess. I was not in a good place. I was engaging in risky behaviors, doing stupid things. A lot of, um, I think my dad retired early because he was so worried about some of my behaviors. <laughs> and, um, but I was struggling, you know, I, I missed my mom. She was, she was really the person that um, she raised us. My dad was there, but he wasn't really present. He worked and, um, and, and struggled with alcoholism. So, you know, growing up, it, it was my mom. And being so much younger than my sisters, it was really just the two of us a lot. So, Kelly, what was your favorite memory of tea with your mom? Oh, I can remember exactly how she made it. She put a little bit of sugar in it, a little bit of milk, and a Lipton tea, black tea. And um, I think some of my favorite memories really go back to 
um, baking with her, making chocolate with her. She was a really, she really made really good um, potato salad. People asked at the funeral if we had her recipe. And although my one sister will say she's perfected my mom's potato salad, I don't agree. <laughs> There's only one mom's potato salad. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, she made these chocolate chip cinnamon bars that were amazing. Still haven't kind of perfected that either. But let me give you an example of my mom. So I'm actually wearing them today. I'm wearing some earrings that she gave me for Valentine's Day one year. My mom's birthday was Valentine's Day. And so I really find it really amazing that, you know, this book came out in February, so close to her birthday. And, but there she was, it was her birthday, but she was still giving us Valentine's presents, you know, still giving, yeah. you know, the earrings and the chocolate. She always made the homemade chocolates. And that's just the way she kind of was. And I was like, telling someone earlier today, my mom was the kind who wrote a thank you card for a thank you card. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And those traits actually came within you because you Absolutely. work with a lot of people now in the field that you're in. Yes. And I, I really like that you had mentioned like the post Kelly, the after Kelly, the po post Kelly, you know, because mm -hmm. there are so many different changes. It doesn't mean that we change as an individual. It's just us learning how to live in a different environment, exactly. a different situation. That person's no longer there. That voice is no longer there. Uh, exactly. Uh, I lost my grandma in November, Kelly. And the one thing that I miss is her voice. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Did you did you have any keepsakes of your mom's speaking or video? Yes, honestly, that's probably you could probably get me choked up about this. That is probably the one thing that I that I that I really miss the most because I remember that point in my grief where I couldn't remember her voice anymore and how hard that was for me. And, you know, my mom died in 94. So this is before cell phones. This is before, you know, what we do. Like, I mean, my dad's 89 now, and I don't even know how many voicemails I have saved from him because like, I'm worried about, yeah. about that and what's going to happen when he's gone. I, and not having that with my mom, we have a, a video where we're at Disney world and, but it was a, we were with a family, another family. And they, so obviously it's them talking cause it's their video. And so my sister recently put it on a uh, DVD for me so I could watch it. And I watched it like praying that you were going to be able to hear my mom's voice in it. And you, you see her, you see her moving, you see me interacting, being a little brat with her. Um, but you, you don't hear her voice yeah. and it stinks. I, so I totally get it like that when you, I feel like it's just, it's such a difficult part of the grief when you reach that point and you can't hear that voice anymore. Is that something that you do with the work that you do, Kelly? To, uh, put it out there for people to get the voice notes and that. When I when I'm working with somebody who's working with a loved who has a family member that's dying or somebody who is terminal themselves, I talk about that. I'm like, make videos, do this. I mean, I remember a couple of years ago, my friend's dad died, and you know he was been sick for a while, and I'm like, go get these books at Hallmark where you can he can read the book, so your son always has this. Take videos, do this, do that, like. I, I think I do that like probably over and above because I don't have it. So I want everybody to make sure they have it. And then I'm like, and then download it, save it on a USB, put one in a safe and put one somewhere else. So you like, you know, our phone can die in any time. And so what happens to all of that stuff on there unless it's backed up? Right. And you really got to back up the stuff because if you don't back it up, then you lose it. Right. Exactly. Um, I'd rather have doubles, triples, quadruples of everything. I, my kids are like, mom, you already have that picture. I'm like, uh, yeah, but I have to have it in this section in case I exactly. forget where this is. And, and exactly. that is, you know, because it, it is a real struggle sometimes to just understand that you're going to want these in the future, right? Because exactly. that person's not going to be there anymore. So yeah. Kelly, this collaboration that you put together, how long did it take you? How did you get the name of it? So... Um, I was part of holistic mental health. I always wanted to be an author, but I didn't really know how to make that happen. And my friend was signed up to be um, an author in holistic mental health. And so she had shared something I was doing about one of my running. I do a program called Healing Strides, where it combines a grief group and training for a 5K race. And at the end of the seven weeks, all the women run a 5K together. And that's like kind of the, the goal, right? 
And so we crossed that finish line together. And so I posted something about it on Facebook and Laura Mazzata from Holistic Mental Health saw it. And she was like, Sherry, do you know her? We need her in this book. And so in Holistic Mental Health, I was able to share my mom's story and I kind of got the bug. I was like, oh, I want to do this again. So then I was did Brave Kids, volume one. And then I was like, oh, I really want to do a grief book. So I reached out to the publisher, Laura DeFranco of Brave Healer Productions, spoke to her in July of what 23, I guess it was, um, or 22. And then I didn't do anything. I got scared. And then I reached out to her again, had another conversation with her in October. Again, was like, mm, don't do anything. And then I had a follow up email from her in my email box for probably a month. And I was like, mm -mm, I, I just can't do it. And then I finally, I spoke to Laura Mazzotta and she's like, just do it, Kelly. And so I did. So I started recruiting authors in January of 23. So I was, um, I wanted a 2024 release date because I really wanted to make it a good book. I think we could have probably done it earlier um, because I did, I, found the authors pretty quickly. I was really quite impressed, but I needed, I needed some space and time. And so it was, um, you know, I've been doing working with these authors for over a year and getting this together. We submitted our chapters in October and have been waiting for the release date. And here we are. So Kelly, what's the chapter, your chapter called? Oh, um, you're, you're going to give me, um, treasured paw prints. And it is actually, it's not about my mom. I write about my mom in the introduction of the book, but I had already told my mom's story in holistic mental health. So I wanted to do a different type of loss in this book. And so I wrote about the death of our pup PJ and Ooh. PJ died in December of 22. And um, he was almost 15 years old and PJ's birthday is Valentine's day too, which was my mom's birthday. So PJ was a special little pup and pet loss is a type of disenfranchised grief. We don't really give it enough credit. And for somebody who's like me, who doesn't have children, our pups become our babies. And I wanted to share about that. And a lot of honestly, what I wrote in my chapter in chapter one is I wrote like the weekend after PJ died. I just felt like I needed to get some of those feelings out and I pulled out my laptop and just started typing. And so I used a lot of that for my chapter. Um, and so what's awesome about the book is each chapter has a story of loss and then a tool for the reader to help them. So since my chapter starts off the book, my tool is a self-care plan. And the goal of it is here's these areas, kind of think about what you can do to help yourself on your grief journey and then go through this book read all the different tools, find out what resonates with you and plug it into your self-care plan. So by the time you finish all 25 chapters, you're going to have a beautiful, amazing self-care plan that can really help you on your grief journey. So like in each chapter, you have a blank sheet in the book where they can write or do they have to get a separate journey to a journal to write? Yeah, they, they can do a separate journal. We also, I made a, I did make a workbook. So I will be adding that to my website that people can download for free and they can that way that they'll have all that space for those journal prompts and things like that. Um, and we're, we're doing a grief conference. So that's coming up in March and for whoever um, attends the grief conference, we'll get that workbook as well. I believe that's March 9th, right? Your conference? Correct. Saturday, March 9th. And the good thing about this conference is it will be recorded. So even if you sign up for it and you can't attend live, you will get all the recordings to watch afterwards and all of the bonus content. Because we have and 15 videos of bonus content for the participants. Oh, wow. And the yeah. tickets for that event can be where, where can people get They're that? on Eventbrite, but you could also go to my website and then click on the Grief Experience Conference and you'll see the link to it. And then some promo codes. Each author has their own promo code, which will save you $10 on the, the registration fee. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah, see, I did my homework. I got I, I got that. <laughs> I got that workshop too. Now, I've seen that on March, I believe, it, uh, pa, Path 11 podcast is supposed to be starting on the 6th. Did it start on the 6th or is it still in the process of coming? 
Oh, uh, Path 11 has been releasing um, podcasts since August of all the different authors. Oh, okay. So they've been out like on a weekly basis. And so all of those are also, you can find all the links on obviously Path 11 podcast or um, on the Center for Informed Grief You There is a, a link for Path 11 and it's got all of the authors that were interviewed by April. Because one of what the amazing part about this is April Hanna, who is one of the owners of Path 11, was one of the authors in the book. So she did this and was able to get to know all the authors and also be able to help promote the book this way. Oh, that's really cool. So how did she come up with that name, Path 11? I don't know. You'll have to ask April. You'll have to have her on for some tea sometime. <laughs> Absolutely. When I, when I found that, I was like, Path 11. I kind of wonder why the 11. Yeah. Because well, numbers, do, numbers with grief do go together too. So. 11, 11 is an angel number, right? So, so that might have something path 11 is all about spirituality and looking at death and dying. They have a documentary that's coming out at some point, hopefully soon on after death communications that I was um, interviewed for. Um, April's busy working on that now. So a lot of their content is around talking about death and dying and spirituality. So Kelly, what's your services? You, you provide uh, the grief and loss. I want to get into word grief and loss because a lot of people, they get them confused, but they do go hand in hand together. Can you mm -hmm. share a little bit with the audience uh, and the listeners what grief and loss is? Yeah. So grief is the feelings associated with the loss, right? And grief doesn't just, isn't just about death. We usually hear the word bereavement when that's grief focused to death, right? But there's many different types of grief. There's an ambiguous loss. There is traumatic grief. There is, um, oh my gosh, of course, now I'm going to forget them all. Um, <laughs> There's disenfranchised grief. There's all of these different types of losses that we experience. And people just tend to think grief means death, right? And that's not the case. And what I'm really excited about in the book is that's not just the case in our book. We have two authors in the book that talk about infertility. You know, this loss of these, these dreams you had, right? And um, of what you expected, you know, oh, you expect to get married and just be able to get pregnant right away. And for so many people, that's not the case. And what I really am happy about is the one male we have in the book is talking about infertility from a male's perspective, which in my opinion, there isn't talked about enough at all. George Garcia was really brave to share that very vulnerably. And Elena Bullock is the, is the author who wrote, writes about it from a female perspective. And if you read the two chapters, there's a, so much overlap, which is really fascinating. But we also have in the book divorce, because when somebody goes through divorce, right, there's loss of so many different things, your home, your friends, um, maybe, you know, those shared friends that you have, um, what your dreams were for the future. There's so many different kinds of loss that we experience. So grief is just the feelings associated with any loss, but we can grieve for so many different things. It's not just death. You know, somebody could be fired from their job. You grieve that and you have to feel those feelings because that is a loss. I really, I, really, I really like, Kelly, that you're mentioning these things because a lot of people think that grief is only when someone passes. There's exactly. so many different types of living grief that we're not talking about, that we're not even touching on in, in today's world, like divorce, mm -hmm. inf infidelity, uh, you know. Uh, and I'm glad that you have a male's perspective because I men have voices too. Men have stories too. And... Mm -hmm they have different ways of looking at things than a woman does. So I'm glad that you have two stories and one's from a woman and one's from a man, because yeah, that's I really going to make it. Because they both had this idea, right? You know, infertility, right? You're supposed to be able to get pregnant you're not supposed to have anything wrong with your sperm or your eggs. And then, and it's, that's not always the case. And I'm glad that you mentioned divorce because that's something I haven't, I, I haven't dealt with. I, I've been divorced since 2008 and I just kind of, okay, it's done. It's closed. Boom, done. Because my life was saved, right? Because I was in a mm -hmm. domestic violence situation. But I mean, grief in a divorce is a hard thing because you lose the family, you lose the friends, you lose, you lose that environment of you know, like a husband and wife, uh, mother and father, it, it broken homes, right? So there's so much be besides. I'm so glad you have all these different stories in your book, Kelly, because it actually opens up. And that's why it went number one, because you had the different things in there. You, 
and I love it that when people put different together because it actually well, makes that's what nice. yeah and that's what I'm I am my one thing I'm like oh I don't want people to be like oh it's a grief book I don't want to read it it is really I truly believe whoever picks it up is going to be able to relate to at least one of the authors in the book you know, it is, we have Sherry Davies in there where she talks about her husband having younger onset Alzheimer's. I mean, he's 55 years old and that's not supposed to happen. Right. And so watch, I mean, she's, she's my best friend. So watching her go through that and seeing her husband's changes and how she's having to grieve, even what the relationship looks like today compared to it a few years ago. Right. And that future, we, we don't just grieve for the past. We also grieve for the future, the, what could have been, you, you know, could that re, like, especially with divorce, right. Thinking about, could that relationship have been different in the future? Could it have changed? Right. Um, and so we have to really look at all of those things. And that's what I really wanted this book to be. I wanted it to be a wide range of different types of loss. I didn't want it to be 25 authors who were teenagers and had their mom die. I didn't want everybody to have the same story as me because not everybody does. Grief is so different and unique for each person. And it's important to show that and these authors are so vulnerable in this. Like I give them so much credit because I sat down, I didn't get to read the chapters ahead of time. I read a few that were my good friends, but I got the book once it was formatted and here you go, Kelly. And I was like, Oh, this is a little nerve wracking. I got to read all this. And I'm, am I going to agree with what people write in here? You know? And I sat on my couch on a Saturday morning, just crying. Like so many of the stories are so vulnerable and so brave and so powerful. I'm so proud of these authors because so many of them are therapists and as therapists, we don't self-disclose. We, you know, we share a little bit what may be helpful for clients, but a lot of people, don't talk about this kind of stuff. And now they're putting their stories out in the world for potentially their clients to read. And it's really brave of them. I think it's brave because it opens up that, uh, that door and path of understanding that even your therapist has things that they go through. Exactly. You know, I think it, it, it it's going to bring a deeper relationship and they say, don't make a relationship with your counselors or your therapist and that. It's not that you become best buddies and high-fiving each other, but it actually brings that, that safety. You feel absolutely more open. You have, to feel, right? you have to feel safe with your therapist, right? You And I've, as a client, you know, I've been a client and I've, you know, have to, you have to feel safe to be vulnerable with them. And sometimes I hear a client say, you know, I've told you more than I've told my spouse, and if you meet with them once a week for however many weeks, I mean, that's a lot of time you spend with them. So, of course, you have, you know, um, a relationship because rapport and relationship really is the primary, you know, what you need to have a good therapeutic relationship. You need that relationship. Right. And Brittany Nelson talks in our book about um, being a therapist and having a client die. And we there we don't talk about that nearly enough. And she says one of her favorite quotes in the in that chapter for me that really stuck out because I have experienced client deaths is, you know, I'm a human as well. And I cared for this person and I grieve for this person. And we we I don't think we give therapists enough. You're just okay, you find out. I remember a couple of years ago somebody didn't show up and I was worried. I reached out a few times, didn't hear anything. And then I said, I finally sent a message and I said, if I don't hear back from you, I'm going to have to call your emergency contact. Didn't hear back. So I contacted the emergency contact and found out she had died. Wow. And that was in between sessions. I was supposed to just stuff it away and then go to my next session and be like, huh, with a woman that, you know, I probably spent 30 hours with and knew pretty well and finding out that she died suddenly and unexpectedly. It, you know, it's, we wear this weird hat as therapists. We're supposed to be one way, but at the end of the day, we're human. Yeah. We care about our clients. We want our clients to do well. We want to help them. Now, sometimes that doesn't always happen, right? I always say like finding a therapist is like finding a bathing suit for a woman. Sometimes the first one you try on fits perfectly. Sometimes you have to keep trying them on until you find the right fit. And sometimes you don't wear an old worn out bathing suit. So sometimes it's time to move on to the next therapist as well. 
I like that. <laughs> you know, like a bathing suit because I I am one that I it takes me forever. My my spouse is like, would you just buy that one? That one looks good, and I'm just like, no, I don't like this. I don't like that. <laughs> yep. And that's like finding a therapist. I mean, sometimes you click with somebody, and sometimes you don't. And, and you want okay. and you really want to click with your therapist when it comes to grief because mm -hmm. you're already going through enough struggle the because grief is like a like a roller coaster one day you're happy Absolutely. you're sad you're you're angry you're you're getting mad at different things and you know uh I one day I'm crying and and the next day I'm giggling and laughing and I'm like like am I losing myself here like what's exactly. going on right exactly. so the different steps of grief Kelly when you do your groups with uh, your services and that, do you allow the guests, uh, not allow because I, that's not a word I want to put in there. Um, do you give the clients a chance to go through those emotions in with the different courses and, and workshops that you provide? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you have to feel it, right? You have to be one of the things that I talk about enough uh, so much. And I always tell my clients, you're probably going to be tired of hearing me say this, but you need to lean into your grief. You need to feel your grief. And I think grief groups are an amazing way to be able to connect with other people who are grieving and to know you're not alone and also to feel safe enough to be able to express your emotions and other people in front of other people that get it because they you know, not everybody gets grief. Not everybody's going to understand it. They think, oh, it's been a few months. You should kind of be over it. And you need to feel safe and be able to come into a room and be able to let those emotions out. And, you know, there isn't stages of grief. This We wish that it was neat and orderly, but what you're talking about is, is exactly right. It's those ups and those downs, right? We don't know when the next down's going to be. We don't know when the next up is going to be. It's a really a hot mess, that's the best way to describe grief, in my opinion. And we oscillate, you know, the dual process model shows it perfectly. We oscillate between the loss oriented and the restoration oriented and back and forth because that's what grief looks like. When I worked at hospice, we did a workshop called Am I Grieving or Going Crazy? Because it can make you feel like that. The memory issues, the difficulty concentrating and focusing, that grief brain and that fogginess. And then one minute you're laughing and then the next you're bawling. You know, it's it's a hot mess. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, it's okay it, if that happens in a group. That's I like that. You know. I like that you had a workshop called that because um, I didn't even know what bereave was when my when my father passed in 2016. I I just had to get some fresh air. I needed to go for a walk, and when I walked went for a walk, I found this building, and I couldn't even say the word bereave. So I went home and I spelt it. I kept saying the letters in my in in my head. And when I got home, I told my spouse, I said, what is this? How do you say this? And then he told me, well, that's for people who have lost someone. And I was like, that's what I need. I just lost dad. I like mm -hmm. I need this. Like, mm -hmm. why? Why? Why don't we know about these services? Why did I not know that we have these services? You know, because grief is something that is not spoken about because it's looked at as weakness. Right. It looks at get over it. It's done. They're gone. Move on. And I, I, for me, it was, I couldn't move on. And then I found that it was complicated grief, right? And when complicated grief gets in, then it's another whole story. So what types of workshops do you provide with your services, Kelly? Well, so I have a couple of different businesses. Obviously, I have my private practice, which is called Greater Life Grief Counseling, where I provide individual and group counseling to people in New York, Florida, and South Carolina. And so I do different groups throughout the year. I do a pet loss group once a month. I do, um, right now, I have a parent group. Uh, grieving the death of a parent group. And I have coping with loss from substance use group. I do, like I talked about before, my healing strides, which is my running program, which I offer twice a year. I do a ton of coping with the holidays programs. I do a motherless daughters group. So I try to, young adult groups, I try to change them up throughout the year and offer different ones to make sure to find the ones that are right for everybody. Because I do think there is rather, I'm not a big fan of having just a general grief and loss group because everybody grieves differently. And so what I find is that, you know, with coping with loss from substance use, everybody in that group gets it. So there's not that stigma and there's not that like, 
other people in the group may be thinking, well, they, you know, oh, they died from substance use. It they, they doesn't mean as much as me who, you know, whatever. I don't want that comparing of losses yep. to happen. So I really try to keep my groups more specific and more niched. Um, and I, I think that's that's really important. And I think for a bereaved mom to be able to walk into a room with other bereaved moms, they don't have to say to each other, oh, how are you? Oh, I'm okay. No, they know they're not okay. And they don't have to say much. They get it with each other. Yeah. And then um, I have Center for Informed Grief, which is a newer business a venture. And really my goal there is to provide education and trainings to therapists and school personnel to help them become more grief informed. Because 60% of therapists did not have any education, undergraduate or graduate in grief and loss. I had to go in college for me and I'm getting a little old now, so I don't really like to say how long I've been out of school, but <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's been 22 years. Oh, um, I don't right? feel like And we that start old. doing the math. Oh, 22 years and she's in school for <laughs> exactly. Yes, I'm 44. But um, right. so, um, when I was at Florida State in the social work department, we didn't have a, a a death and dying class. I went to the religion department and I went to the nursing department and took classes. We didn't have a grief class. I believe now they do. But a lot of schools dis schools still don't do that. And then if you look at teachers, they have even less training and education in grief and loss. But yeah. these are the ones that are maybe working with these kids because one in 12 children will have a parent or a sibling die by the time they're 18 years old. So I really want to be able to help school personnel and therapists to feel more comfortable with grief and loss. Just like you said a little while ago that you have to find the right therapist for grief. Yeah. And you do because not every therapist is grief informed. So they're not going to be comfortable sitting with you in that grief and holding that space for you either a, because they have their own unresolved grief that they haven't dealt with, or they just don't have the education and they're going off of the five stage model and giving inaccurate information out. So I think it's really, I really, that is my goal. It's really what I'm passionate about is to really help people feel comfortable with it so they can help more clients. Because you know what? Do you know how many clients I turn away on a weekly basis? A lot. And I have like a couple of therapists in the community that I truly feel comfortable referring them to. And they're usually full. And then even our local hospice, like they sometimes close it to community resources or community clients. And so we're really stuck with clients maybe going to therapists that have said things that aren't helpful or have minimized their grief or made them feel like they were doing their grief wrong. And so that's really my goal with Center for Informed Grief is really to get that information out. And honestly, I hope the Grief Experience book does that. I hope it, you know, people will pick it up and understand what somebody who's grieving really goes through. I, I, Kelly, I think that's really important, you know, that you're saying no to clients because you're telling them it's not going to be a good match. I'm, it's, it's not going to help with your process of, you know, because it is a process. And like you said, the five stages, when I first read it, I, I picked up a book about grief and it was like, you have seven stages of grief and you're going to go through this. So then I was like, kind of check marking. Okay. Well, I've done this mm -hmm. one, but this exactly. one hasn't happened. This one hasn't happened. And uh -huh. I'm like, uh -huh. is this what am how I doing it's wrong? supposed to happen? <sighs> right? Like then you start, mm -hmm. like uh, there's a lot of books out there on grief that are actually doing damages because they, they write in a form that they, they want you to go through these stages in a certain order. And if you don't go through that order, then you're not actually healing yourself. You're not working through it. You're not getting past it, you know, and it's the wording. Uh, one thing I, I learned when, when I became a part of Brie Families years ago was never say the word should. Mm -hmm. You know, we shouldn't be on anybody. You should do this. You should do that. You should. Mm -hmm. That is one word that we were told that we needed to remove from our vocabulary because everyone processes different. Everyone looks at grief differently. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be the same loss similarities, but each person's grief story is different. So that was one thing that I had learned through my training and that as well is to remove that word. I'm really glad that you're in the schools because this is why I do tea time is because I want the education out there, right? I want to teach people that everyday people like yourself, Kelly, are making that difference and saying, you know what, it's not there. Let's change it. Let's bring it there. 
let's get these and get the teachers informed let's get the students informed and you also have a support group on facebook for students so i want to yes. know a little bit more for, about that group. For, for, for school yeah for therapists so i have supporting grieving students and children and that's for therapists and school personnel and i provide resources in there i offer some trainings from time to time i do have an upcoming training with actually continuing education hours that i'm doing at the end of march on helping support um childhood grief I also have another Facebook group, which is called the Grief Empowerment Group, and this is for grieving individuals, for adults, to be able to connect with other people who are grieving, to feel less alone in their grief. We Every month, we pick a different topic and a tool to kind of give you some actual resources to help you, so it's not just a group where you're just sharing all the time, because I think we also need to be able to give people some information, some, you know, some tools and resources to be able to help them. So that way they can transform the grief. Grief isn't something we ever get over, but it is something we can learn to live with. And it is something we can integrate into our lives in a healthy way. Obviously, certain things are going to come up. I mean, I did a TikTok the other morning that I'm like still cringing that I actually posted because I was talking about the book. I was excited about the book. And then I started talking about my mom and I burst into tears. And, um, and I put it off and I was like, you know what? It is what it is. This is who I am. This is how I'm feeling right now. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna filter it, but I want to, I really want to be able to. And so it shows, right? I'm almost at 30 years since my mom died. I still grieve for her. I still miss her. Do what, you know, I've dedicated this book to her. And although she's not physically here, I, I believe she's with me in, in some sort of spirit and some sort of connection. But I, um, you know, grief isn't something we get over, We but we can learn to integrate it into our lives. And there is things we can do to be able to help ourselves. So uh, Kelly, for uh, the workshops and that, are they virtual or are they in person? How, how do people go about that? So my trainings are virtual. So you can go to the Center for Informed Grief and go under trainings. I'm also available to do in-person trainings. I did a couple of in-person trainings at local schools in upstate New York last year where I met with social workers and school counselors and did, you know, some really in-depth trainings with them. But I am available for virtual trainings. And um, I have some online courses that are you can download. I have some grief journals you can download and use with children. And um, I try to offer some, you know, resources and trainings for free in that in the Supporting Grieving Students and Children Facebook group. So Kelly, let's talk about those grief journals. How does writing really help with grief? Well, with kids, you know, there's different. So there's prompts in there and then there's writing and drawing because we know that children grieve differently than adults and everybody honestly grieves differently. So we have to find what works best for everybody, right? And for some people, it is going to be writing. Writing the story out is, is is healing. For some people, it's drawing that art piece, right? You know, April Hannah talks about art using help her in the book. We have Jean who finishes the book at chapter 25. She talks about using journey dance to deal with her grief and how she uses that as an expression, which is so out of my comfort zone. But I did do a, a <laughs> workshop with her and um, it, it was awesome. But it is definitely, you know, we have to find what works. And so having kids be able to do something and write it out and color it out, that, that can be really helpful and beneficial. And it also gives some counselors a tool, right? Here's a tool that you can do with these kids on maybe an, in a group setting or an individual setting when they don't maybe feel like they have the resources to support them. Well, this journey da dance, that sounds interesting. <laughs> oh, it is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to no, share a little no. bit about that dancer? <laughs> well, so um, I went, she did a grief workshop last year. And so it's very, you're in your own space, right? You're, you're doing your own thing. You're, you're letting just be free, which I'm not great at. <laughs> I, have, I have no rhythm. <laughs> So it's something like the movie Sister of the Yaha Hood or something, right? Yeah, Where Sandra yes. Bullock is just in the wild doing her little yes, dance. Exactly. That's kind of exactly. That's a great. Yeah. <laughs> but then she kind of led us through this, this really powerful part where we kind of, she said, start going through your life and all the losses you've experienced and just kind of feel into it. And I was like, okay, what, what's going to come up? And what came up for me was grieving the loss of my childhood home, 
When I graduated from high school, my dad sold the house and we moved out like the Monday after I graduated. And that was the home I lived for 17 years and all those memories connected to my mom, which then I just went away to college like two weeks later. So there really wasn't a lot of time to like kind of process that. And I never realized really what the impact was until I did that dance. And then all of a sudden I'm crying over all of that of that house and that feeling of safety I had there and all those memories connected to my mom there. So it was really it was really interesting what came up for me in that. Like it wasn't at all what I expected. Well, and that's the thing, right? When it, we're going through it, it's that roller coaster, right? Things mm -hmm. happen and we're like, oh, we're off track a little bit, but mm -hmm. we're actually on the right track because that's our journey of our grief. Yep. You know, yep. uh, I, re I really want to get into your tea because your tea itself is really a transformational tea through grief, right? So the, mm -hmm. the words that you gave me for your tea was transformation, um, empowerment, and awareness. So tell me why you gave me those three words, Kelly. So transformation, because grief does transform us. We are not the same person before a lot, you know, like I said before, right? There's those phases of Kelly. There's pre my mom's death and post, right? And who I am today even, and who I even was four years ago is different than I am today. And so this transformation and really grief has transformed my life. You know, um, on some spiritual level, I believe that I was supposed to go through this really challenging, different experience to be able to be where I am today. And without my mom's death, I don't know what I would have done with my life. And it's transformed me. And I do think grief can change us and then transform us. I mean, it's why people start foundations. It's why people do different things to find that meaning in their grief, right? Um, and that's okay. We can transform us. And sometimes good can come out of it. Um, and then that empowerment piece. I really want people to feel that empowered, to feel in, on an individual level that in their grief that they have some steps and tools they can use, but also for therapists to be more empowered to feel comfortable sitting with a grieving client and not to feel like they have to say, you know, oh, that doesn't fit in that stage or whatever it is to feel empowered that they can help a grieving individual. And then awareness. I love talking about grief psychoeducation. I love talking about why you shouldn't use the five stages. I think that is my mission in life is to get that out there um, because it's not helpful. Yeah. And so being able to raise awareness about what grief looks like, like we've talked about, it isn't just death. It is so many different types of losses. And we experience loss in so many ways throughout our entire life. And we continue to grieve and grieve and grieve. It's, everybody goes through grief. It's a normal, natural response. And I, and I love the word awareness because awareness is the awareness of the future, right? How we can change things. And I'm so glad that you're on that mission to take those five stages. No disrespect to the people that are writing the stage books, but they actually are, uh, you know, they, there's a lot of, a lot that people don't understand, right? And when we read these self-help books or books that say that we should go through these certain stages, and then if we don't go through one stage, then we're like, well, What's wrong with us? Like, exactly. how come we're not doing exactly. this? You know, um, that that's one of my biggest frustrations is when I read self-help books where they have the stages or mm -hmm. you, you, you're, you're going to go through this flow. And if I don't go through that flow, then I'm like, okay, so this book is not helping me. And then I get frustrated. And then I'm like, I don't want to exactly. look for another book because the next book is going to tell me I'm not doing something else again. Right. So then exactly. Exactly. My grief, my grief story, Kelly has been really much of a frustration path where it's, can we get a book that actually understands that every process is different? Every grief is different, you know? Mm -hmm. And someone who has gone through a grief similar to yours is not going to be the same as yours. Exactly. And, you know, I, I, I'm really enjoying this conversation because we're putting it out there and we're getting people educated on the paths that your grief story is not going to be the same as the next person. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kelly, you, okay. uh, right. No. And, and, and it's like when you said, when you walk into a group and they say, are you okay? I'm okay. You, we don't hear that when we're put into a group with the same similar losses, but when we're put into a general 
group, we do ask that, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I always tell everybody when Miss Liz says I'm okay, I'm not okay. You better be looking out for me. You better be. <laughs> nope, she gave me the word okay. That woman not okay. Like, let's go get her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. That You're would be right? mine. I'm fine. If I say I'm good, then I'm good. But I mean, if I say I'm okay, oh, yeah. Miss Liz needs yeah. help. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kelly, I also asked you to give me one word that describes you as a person, and you gave me the word passionate. Why that word? I mean, my whole, I, I think about this, I've, I've been doing a lot of exploration recently about my legacy and who, what am I leaving, right? I don't have children. So what am I leaving behind? And my identity, my identity so much is tied to my, my career and to what I do for a living. And as my husband jokes around with me, it's what the books I'm reading, it's the things I'm listening to, even the TV shows. He's like, why are you watching this? You don't hear enough of this in your own office. Um, but it is, it, grief and loss is what I am passionate about. It is what I, I love talking about it. I know most people don't want to hear me talk about it, but... <laughs> That I makes do. people uncomfortable, right? Well, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you know, I used to do, I have some signs in here in my office where we used to do, it's like, um, it's uh, like board and brush where you paint these signs, these wooden signs. And we have all these, and I have quotes all over my office of these signs that I made. And I used to joke with them when we go to their, to the workshop that you need a grief category. You need a death category on now on your website because of all the signs that I've created with these quotes. <laughs> but it is, it's what I'm passionate about. It is, it is why I, you know, I mean, so much of my life has been built on doing this and I'm grateful for that passion. I'm proud of that passion. And I truly believe my book, this book that we created with some amazing women and George and, um, but 24 amazing authors. I feel like this is part of my legacy I'm leaving behind. So somebody can pick it up and, and feel connected. Not like what you said when you pick it up, right? If you don't like that one chapter, go to the next, yeah. you know, we have, we have one chapter talking about the power of prayer, which may not align with everybody. And then the next chapter is from a medium. You know, we have a funeral director in there talking about her experience of being, you know, holding that space for people once their loved one has died there. It's just a wide range. And I do believe that this is part of, of my legacy and I'm really proud of it. I'm so glad you used that word legacy. I, I know why you came to me because this is what this is. This is the legacy. This tea mm -hmm. time will be the legacy of Kelly sharing the grief. So in five years, down the road, if you find this tea time somewhere, you're going to get educated on the grief. You're going to get educated mm -hmm. on this book. You're going to be able to go and grab this book five years from down the line. Yes, hopefully, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully still it's going to be a bestseller. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be there. And I'm so glad that it, it won best a number one in grief and loss because that's what mm -hmm. it is. But you just mentioned something, Kelly, that just took me back for a sec. Is the funeral directors. We never really understand what they go through seeing death after death after death. That has to have some impact on them. And especially if they have their own family members, right? Because they have to step back. Yeah. Like you said, like when you, when you, when your client passed away, you had to go into the office with the next one and mm -hmm. it's, you know, compartmentalize it. Right. So anyone who is listening to the tea time and that will be sharing the tea time and watching the replay, go out and grab this copy of this book because there's going to be some incredible stories in there. And again, Kelly, I really want to congratulate you on taking that step and getting in there. Now, I want to go back because we have a, a couple questions here that have come in that I want to ask you uh, about the student support. What age is it started and and until what up? Uh, what age does oh. it end? I elementary, middle or high school and even college students, you know, I think every if a child is old enough to love, they're old enough to grieve. And we need to have resources and support for any grieving child in the school, you know, in, creating an individualized bereavement plan. So everybody's on board, giving them the resources they need. I love working with school counselors and social workers to be able to offer school based grief groups, meet them where they're at. And, you know, also 
grief, grief camps. We haven't even talked about that, but I'm a volunteer at Cindy's comfort camp. And since 2010, and I've done multiple grief camps throughout the country and grief camps are a great way. Refer your kids, find out the resources that are available in your community, get them support because you know what, as I say at every camp that I do to my little group, cause I like run like many grief groups through the weekend healing circles, we call them. I always say to the volunteers, if nothing but these children get to know that they're not alone in their grief, it was worth our time this weekend. And that was the next question. Do you provide any uh, camps for kids? Yeah, so I volunteer at Cindy's Comfort Camp. There's camps all over the country. You can go to the Dougie Center and the National Alliance for Grieving Children. You can do to find a program near you. A lot of local, look at your local hospice, start there. So many of them offer children's grief programs, camps, and grief groups. And they, I truly believe, are what can make a huge difference. I wouldn't be talking to you today if I didn't go to that hospice grief teen group. And so make another- your kids go to camp <laughs> and go to grief groups, even if they don't want to, <laughs> because they need it. So Kelly, and another question we have, are any of the authors in the book willing to do a podcast? Oh, I'm sure a lot of them would. Yeah, absolutely. And there's another- all their contact information at the end of each chapter is a, is their bio with a picture of them and their contact information. But you can also check out the grief experience on Facebook and Instagram. You can message me and I can connect you with an author if you're looking for a specific topic. Awesome. I'm just quickly checking before we go. So I do want to get into the hostile holistic mental health and brave kids before we wrap up. Could you tell us yeah, a little sure. bit about, about that as well? So holistic mental health is what I started with. That's where I share my story of my mom's death. And in it is a wide range of different, um, more holistic techniques to help somebody with their mental health journey. They do have holistic mental health volume two coming out, which I'm not a part of, but I do know some people that are. And I saw Laura Mazzotta this past weekend, the lead author for that. So it's going to be another amazing book. Brave Kids is a book of 25 stories of kids stories, all different ranges of things, not just grief. There's a couple of grief stories in volume one, but there's about bullying. There's about confidence. There's amazing kids stories. Volume two is coming out on March 5th, which I'm a part of. And in it, I wrote the story about a classroom bunny rabbit that dies because that happens. And um, schools don't always know how to prepare and respond to that either. So well, I think that's really important. And you're going into the schools because we haven't even talked about pe- class pets. Because no. I know when I was in elementary school, that was back in the day a long time. I'm going to be 50 in May. so. <laughs> but, but I mean, we never had the grief classes in the schools and that. So I'm really glad that you're bringing that forward. So Kelly, what final message do you have for all the listeners today out there? If you're grieving, you're not alone in your grief. There is support. If you do need some professional support, find a therapist who is grief informed, ask them questions. It's okay to kind of screen them, ask them if it's a, say a suicide loss, ask them if they have experience with that type of loss. That's okay. If you are a school personnel or therapist and you want to get more grief informed, please feel free to reach out. I would love to have you part of my grief, um, my Facebook communities and check out the book. It really is an amazing book. Also check out Brave Kids Volume 2. Like I said, it's coming out in March. I want to plug just that book a little bit because my niece is part of it. She's the first teen author in Brave Healer Productions, and she's 16 years old. And she wrote a story about her own personal journey of overcoming selective mutism. So I'm so proud. She's my goddaughter. And I'm so proud to be in that book with her. Oh, well, Kelly, you'll have to hook me up so we can get this out there on Tea Time. Uh, yeah. Because I think yeah. it's really important to get the kids' voices as well. I'm very leery, and uh, not leery, but I'm very guarded with children because of what the virtual line can do to a child. But mm-hmm. I mean, I really would like to get some more information on this book and that. And let's get yeah. that book out there as well. Let's push it out yeah, there. Absolutely. Get, get that a number one bestseller as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Kelly, I really want to thank you for joining me. Uh, I want to wrap it up with your favorite color. Your favorite color is aqua. So why aqua? 
it's just bright and fun and lively. I think for me personally, I think, you know, I can hold that space for somebody grieving, but I also like to laugh with my clients. I like to be able to smile. And I think aqua kind of represents that. And as you can see behind me, my wallpaper and my walls are that color. Uh, most of my house is that color. It's just a good, lively, fun color. My scarf almost matches your wall. I've been yes, watching that. And I, was like, <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, the scarf almost matches the design on the wall. <laughs> it, well, it's been a pleasure to have you here, Kelly. And I really am um, all uh, celebration, a big, big celebration that it, we're getting those books out that really need to get out there. And thank you for giving your services and providing services to individuals across the globe with, with, with your work. And congratulations to all of the authors on this book. High five to you all. You made number one bestseller. Go out, celebrate, enjoy mm -hmm. the moment because exactly. it, it really is a time for you to celebrate yourself and your journey and your story because your stories do matter and they do make a difference. So again, celebrate all of you guys. And again, Kelly, again, it was a pleasure to meet you today and sit with you. And I will be back at 7 p.m. Uh, not a problem. Absolutely. This was amazing. And I will be back at 7 p.m. with Paul Morrow. And we'll be talking about self-love in his book and, and that. And he'll be coming in from Western Australia. So we're traveling today. This afternoon, we're in, in the United States and Canada with Miss Liz. And then tonight, Canada with Miss Liz and Western Australia with Paul. So until then, I will see everybody for the second TEA of this week, February 8th, 2024.